Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm glad that you could join us today. Today, I want to present to you the Christian's response. I really didn't want to get involved with the issues here because so many people have been dealing with it and some appropriately. But I also think that some people do not deal with the issues with the George, George Floyd murder currently. And so I just want to lend a perspective from Christians. I know there are many good responses out there. And so I'm not even going to be coming with social policy prescriptions like what the government should do. So let me just give you a start of where I'm going. And this is about the Christian's response to that man's murder, George Floyd. So I just want to say that much has been said about the horrible murder of George Floyd. I don't need to get into the recommendations of reform. There are many wise recommendations out there. Neither must I look into the past of George Floyd to know and to judge him. It doesn't really matter what he was like in the past, as some people try to dig up his past. The fact of the matter is he was wrongly killed. There is no two way about that. And the insights, you know, the Bible tells us why these things happen. And especially in the last days, We'll show you a text from Timothy. So we know many people will attempt to reform this system to make changes. Hopefully, and we are certainly desiring this for laws to be made and laws to be enforced. We are looking for training to be conducted. People may even offer concessions to the underprivileged class. There is no doubt about that. But the question is, will the real problem be solved? And what is God's response? Now, in, in the old Bible gives a warning that is very much applicable to us today. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, it is written, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal. That's a key word. Despisers of good. Yep. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. The Bible says in the last days, perilous times will come and here are some people who are described amongst the other things as brutal. And so let's look at the roots of slavery. Africans were brutally separated from their homeland in Africa and brought to the West as slaves, packed tight as sardines in suffocating holds of rickety ships. I can't breathe was their cry in the holds of the slave ships. They were treated worse than animals. They were bought, sold, raped, used, abused, and killed at will. They were separated from families and they were worked to death. I can't breathe, was their cry. They were denied their heritage, their language, their culture, their religion, their names, their identities. I can't breathe. After emancipation, after a brutal civil war fought to release them, laws were enacted to keep them down again and deny them their human rights. I can't breathe. Jim Crow laws, lynchings, apartheid, and numerous strategies were desired to keep them down. I can't breathe. You know, some people don't even know about mental slavery. So the roots were the arrest of the people to take them here, but then they were demonized in black. They have things like black market, where things are bought and sold so-called illegally. Blacklist, 
a group of undesirable people. Black eyes, something that doesn't look good. Black out, there is no light. Black box, black mood, black magic. Black magic is white magic better than black magic. Black death, when the black death swept through Europe, there were Caucasians. Why was it a black death? The black sheep of the family. So if somebody is bad, there are black sheep. Why not a pink sheep, a white sheep, a brown sheep, but a black sheep? Black face to mock people, black hand, black head, black hole, black shirt, black nail for extortion, black leg, black ball, black mark, and more. Do you get the idea that black was demonized? Black has led to mental slavery. And as a result, so many people have bought into it that even blacks bleach themselves. I can't breathe. Blacks bleach their faces to look brown, to look white, because they too have subscribed to the fact that black isn't good. They demonized black. Black wasn't even the word that God used in the Bible. He called the Ethiopian. And, but black is a name coined from Negro. And, and, and so because the Spanish word for Negro, Spanish word for black is Negro. Well, not every African is as black as star, but it doesn't even matter the hue, the complexion. It was designed as a way to keep people down. And even today, the great big USA, when you tick a box, what race, what ethnicity are you? There is a separation, a distinction. There is a country that has a motto, out of many, one people. And there are blacks, there are Indians, there are Chinese, there are Syrians, they are all nationalities and there is no box to tick because everyone has one nationality, demonizing black. And there are more. There were more designs that were thought out and set in place to keep blacks down. And you can Google them and find them online. And the worst amongst these were and are so-called Christians who justified, who supported, and, de and defended this brutal anti-God satanic practice. Yes, there are Christians today who support it, even if they don't come out and say it out loud. There are Christians who rejoice in their hearts and say, yes, the only good black man is a dead black man. There are people like that, and let us not deny it. But what God's design is. In Acts 17, 26, we learn that God made all the nations of one blood. In Acts 17, 26, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. It seems like people don't understand and biology tells us we all have one mother, one father, our genes can be traced back to Adam. Our genes can be traced back to Noah. But we turn on each other with a fury that's hardly seen in the animal kingdom. God also has no partiality. In Acts 10, verses 34 to 35, when Peter went to the house of Cornelius, then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So with that background, with that background, let us pray to find out what God's will, oh Lord in heaven. We pray that you will teach all people that all of us are made of one blood, that you have no partiality, and that you will require an account of what we have done to our brothers and sisters. Help us, O oh Lord, to learn the Christian's response, because we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.
So Satan has a strategy of mind control. In 1 John 5, 19, we read, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Notice now, it didn't say the black men, it didn't say the white men, it didn't say the Chinese, it didn't say the Japanese, it didn't pick out one continent, it didn't pick out some ethnic groups. It says the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Revelation 12 verse 9 tells us this is done through deception. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and all his angels were cast out with him. I want to tell you that the first and foremost way that people are brought under the sway of the devil is through deception. People are deceived into thinking that there is something called the superiority of races. That is a deception. But people don't understand that Satan doesn't care who he deceives. The, the, the man who oppresses another is very much under the sway of the evil one. And the world, those who are brainwashed into believing that they are in fear, they too are under the sway of the evil one. And those who believe that they are not their brother's keeper, they are under the sway of the evil, wicked one. Those who believe that a person is justified in getting such a brutal treatment is under the sway of the wicked one. Those who want to find excuses and find reasons not to be upset about this, you are under the sway of the wicked one. You are under the mind control of the devil. If you can't find anything wrong, and anything repugnant and anything evil about what happened to that man, what happened to many others, what happened throughout the years, what has happened throughout the centuries, you are under the sway of the evil one. Your mind has been affected and you need to understand that. Yes, mind control, deception, so I want to tell you a story of a disciple, a disciple of Christ. Christ had a disciple who was just like some of these people today. And this disciple, unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you look at it, was called the disciple whom Jesus loved. Isn't that interesting? Let us look briefly and do some investigation. It's all written in the Gospel of John. Now in John 13, verse 23, John 19, verse 26, John 20, verse 2, John 21, verse 7, and John 21, verse 20, it is written five times in the Gospel of John, there was the disciple whom Jesus loved. So now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That's the first reference. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And the first, third one, then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. The fourth reference, then therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now notice now the fifth one. Then Peter turning around saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following. So who was that disciple? Well, we know this, that it was not mentioned by any other gospel that this was uh, who this disciple was. We know that he was one of the 12 because he was with Jesus at the Last Supper. We know that it was not Peter because Peter was wondering about this disciple. We know that when in the fourth reference that there were only seven apostles after the crucifixion of Jesus who were fishing. And so through trial and error, we know that John was the one. And how do we know? Jesus basically said, 
What do you want to know about this disciple? What do you care if he lives until I return? And when we recognize from the scriptures, John was the one who lived until Jesus returned to the Isle of Patmos. So John was the disciple whom Jesus loved. And I'm going somewhere with this, so bear with me. So who was John? John was a fisherman by trade who worked in the family business. He was first a disciple of John the Baptist and with Andrew were the first two who became Jesus's disciples in John chapter one, verses 35 to 42. Is that the reason why he was called the disciple whom Jesus loved? I don't think so. John had a brother, James, and they were sons of a man named Zebedee. Their mother was also alive and identified as Salome, a follower of Jesus. In Mark 15, 40, it says, there were also women looking on afar off. They were at the cross, they were at the crucifixion, among whom was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the less and of Joseph and Salome. So who is this Salome? Well, we look further in Mark 27, 56, we read among which were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's children. So the same three persons, but instead of Salome, we find the mother of Zebedee's children. So Je Salome is the mother of Zebedee's children. But then when we look at the woman at the cross in John 19, 25, now there stood by the cross of Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. Now we see that there are four women. Mary Magdalene is common. Mary the mother of James and Joseph is Mary the wife of Cleopas or Cleopas. Then there was Jesus' mother and the other one was Jesus' mother's sister. Hello, which means that Salome is Jesus's mother's sister, which suggested that John was a cousin, a first cousin of Jesus. Is this why he was called the disciple whom Jesus loved? No, but what, who was John? Well, it's obvious from God, John's gospel, he, he wrote nothing revealing about himself, except he declared five times he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. Yet John told us that Judas was a thief. John told us that Peter denied Christ. So was John perfect? Is that why he was the disciple whom Jesus loved? Well, the good thing is we have the other gospels to tell us something about John. John did not naturally possess loveliness of character. He was proud, self-assertive, ambitious for honor, impetuous, resentful for under injury. He and his brother were called sons of thunder in Mark 3, 17. And his defects came through strongly on several occasions. Let's look at this. One of them was jealous. In John, Mark 9, 38 to 40, G, he spoke about there was somebody not following us, casting out demons in your name, and we forbid him because he does not follow us. But Jesus said, do not forbid him for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me for he who is not against us is on our side. So the disciples stopped the man from working and they thought they were right. Maybe they were jealous and thought this man was such a powerful evangelist that he would become the top, the king of the heap and they tried to stop him. They were jealous of this man's top success. Is this the disciple whom Jesus loved? We need to know that John wanted to be on the right hand side and his brother on the left hand side of Jesus in the kingdom. So he was a politician, you know, in Matthew 20, 20 to 23. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and on the other on the left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, we are able. Is this the disciple who Jesus loved? In, in the kingdom of God, conquest through sitting on the right hand and on the left hand of God, doesn't come by favoritism. It comes by self-conquest 
through the grace of Christ. It comes when we drink the cup. It comes when we are baptized with the baptism. Jesus says, whoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. When we look at the slave masters, they were not servants. They wanted to be boss. They wanted to be ministers and thought that they were great. But in the eyes of Jesus, that was not greatness. That was satanic tyranny. In the kingdom of God, position is the result of character. The crown and the throne are the tokens of self-conquest through the grace of Christ, meaning we only gain the crown, we only gain the throne when we have overcome our inherited and cultivated tendencies to evil through the grace of Christ. Is John the disciple that Jesus loved? Then let's point out this one, John was a racist. Yes, the disciple who Jesus loved was a racist. In, in Luke chapter 19, 51 to 56, now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set up for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. You know, there they are. They were willing to destroy the Samaritans. They didn't care one bit about them. They didn't care one thing that these people were people as well. They were willing to burn them up because they were not Jews. They treated the Samaritans like dogs. Is this the disciple who Jesus loved? They would have gladly destroyed them from the face of the earth. Is this the disciple who Jesus loved? But Jesus rebuked them and shows that racism has no place in his kingdom. Racism has no place in the kingdom of God. I hope people understand this. Racism has no place in his kingdom. Racism has no place in his church. Those who, who hold on to that satanic mental slavery should recognize that Jesus is not just rebuking James and John. But Jesus is rebuking this racist of today. Is this the disciple who Jesus loved? Well, so who was John? Yet yeah, not too long after the cross, we see John preaching in Samaria. The same people who he wanted to burn down with Peter and welcome into the fold as brothers, the old enemy, the Samaritans. Notice. In Acts 18, 8, verse 14 to 17. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. You know, there are some people who talk about Jesus is the Holy Spirit. So ridiculous. Here they were baptized in the name of Jesus, but they didn't even receive the Holy Spirit. And anyway, John was the one who came to Samaria with Peter to ensure that the brethren, the now brothers, those who we used to hate, he welcomed them into the fold. Now, this sounds like the apostle that Jesus loved. Others came into the church and held various posts, and John was one who was encouraging new Gentile believers in the faith. The one who was a racist was no longer a racist. John was the first one to see where Jesus lived, and he remembered the exact time of the day. He said it was about the 10th hour. 
70 years afterwards, John showed with the writing of the gospel that he wanted still to be in Jesus' So when Jesus told him, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. But I want to tell you people, Jesus not taking any races to heaven. Jesus is not taking any races to heaven. I hear one man say they hear, he heard a, a, a preacher says that when white people pray, that God immediately answer the prayer, but when others pray, it's not like that. How ridiculous can it be? Jesus shows no preference to any color, no caste, no caste, no nationality. The gospel goes to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. John, when he recognized how Jesus was so dear to him, when Jesus told him he was come again, the last words of the Bible, he which testifies these things says, surely I come quickly, amen. And John ended with this prayer, even so come, Lord Jesus. Even so come. How did John change to be the disciple of love? How did racist, firebrand, quick-tempered, jealous, politician, ambitious John come to exhibit caring love, zealous love, obedient love, intimate love, sacrificial love. How? So we are talking today about the Christian's response. And so we want to go to that. But before we answer, I want to tell you that it's not only black people who were in slavery, but Israel was in slavery too. In Acts 7, 6, we learned, I mean, we know in Exodus that they were in slavery, but God spoke in this way, that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. Amazing. How long have the Africans been in slavery in the West? About 400 years. Now is the time for liberation. You know, just like how the children of Israel were released from Egypt by the seven, the plagues, those people who keep holding on to their bondage, who want to keep people in bondage, will also experience the plagues. But I want to tell you, it's all sorts of people in bondage. You know, in when look at let us look at Moses in Exodus 2, 11 to 12. Now it came to pass in the, those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that way. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now let me talk to you, black people. You are like Moses when you go and kill others. There it was. Moses was a prince in Egypt. Moses was going to be fear of Egypt. But Moses identified with the Hebrews. And Moses saw that his people were groaning under slavery. Moses was vexed. Moses was hurt. Moses was enraged. And as a result, he went and he killed the Egyptian. And as a result, he had to flee from Egypt for 40 years. Let me tell you, God is saying in this that he doesn't condone it because Moses thought he was going to deliver the Egyptian, the Israelites, but God does not use murder. And so when you people go out to protest, when you go out to use murder, when you go out to loot, when you go out to burn, when you go out to steal, when you go out to kill, you are not doing God's work. I'm talking about the children's, um, is Christian's response. Let's look a little bit more on Moses. In Numbers 20, verse 7 to 8, when the children of Israel were going to the promised land and they were complaining, verse what, for water. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together. 
speak to the rock before your eyes and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give to the congregation their animals. Moses was told to take his rock and speak to the rock. He wasn't told to strike the rock. He was told to speak to the rock. But Moses said to them, here now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. Numbers 20, 22, 11. He struck the rock. Moses struck the rock. We smash the windows. We burn the cars. We riot. We steal. We kill. We destroy. Moses struck the rock. We do the same when we go out and vent with anger. Yes, a loss of self-control. Moses was filled with the spirit. He was the humblest man on earth. He spent 40 years in Midian following after sheep and learning all the arrogant ways of Egypt. He was now approaching 40 years leading the people of Israel. He bore along with their numerous unreasonable provocations, but he snapped as a result. And no, Moses was not allowed to go in the promised land. Losing our tempers, losing our self-control under the worst provocation is not acceptable to God. Exercising wrath is giving place to the devil. God can provide friends grace in the time of need. Notice what God says. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let me break it down for you. You are okay being angry. It is okay to be angry. And any man who sees that brutal murder and doesn't feel any way something is wrong with you, your feelings are dead. Anyone who sees that wickedness and doesn't feel your blood boil, something is wrong. You need heart surgery. You need to have a heart to feel tenderness and pain at the brutal wickedness. But even though you're angry, you should not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't give vent to wrath. And these people, especially in the night, they go to rob, to loot, to steal, to kill. But the Bible says in John 10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Yes, when people react to the wrath, when people react to the murder, when people react to the racism, and they go out to loot, to steal, to kill, and to destroy, you are under the sway of the devil. You are deceived by the devil. You are fooled by the devil. You are under the control of the devil. And that is not the Christian's response. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have abundantly. Looting and rioting is never of God. I have to tell the truth. No excuse for evil behavior. It is not the way of God. Plundering, looting, rioting, destroying, taking people's lives is not the way of God. No, I don't know who is doing all of that. And I don't know who is instigating that. And I know that there may be some people just coming in there to cause more trouble. But I'm speaking to those who are protesting racism, who are protesting discrimination, who are protesting murder. Let me tell you, it is the thief who steals and kills and destroys. Wrath gives place to the devil. I am speaking about the Christian's response here. I'm not talking about how politicians should respond. I'm not talking about how sociologists should respond. I am not talking about how other people should respond. I am talking about how Christians should respond. We should never encourage looting and stealing and killing and rioting. That is from the devil. You are giving place to the devil and you are under mental slavery to the devil and you don't even know it. The devil deceives the whole world. 
There are some people who think it is a rightful response, but that is a deception. It is a deception. It is never a rightful response because you are displaying the characteristics of the devil. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, you need to control your anger. You need to have self-control. Moses, for 40 years, he led the children of Israel in the wilderness. And he was well behaved. And one mistake, he struck the rock. He didn't even kill another man again. He struck the rock and he did not go into the promised land. Do you think looters and stealers and killers can go into the promised land? You better think again. God tells us there is a better way. And that is love. The greatest commandment Jesus told a man. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And then he says, and your neighbor as yourself. So the lawyer said to him, you have answered, Jesus said to him, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. But the lawyer wanting to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So Jesus told the story about the good Samaritan. The what? The good Samaritan. Do you think John listened to that story? John hated the Samaritans. And Jesus told this story, a true story about the good Samaritan. We're Jews, Jews who persecuted the Samaritans. Jews who persecuted the Samaritans. One Jew was beaten. One Jew was left half dead. One Jew was left by the roadside. And Jesus said, the priest, the Levite, they passed him by and they didn't have any pity on him. But a Samaritan, the hated enemy, came and had mercy on him, had compassion on him, and he bruised butt and bound up his wounds, poured in oil and wine, put him on his donkey, took him to an inn, treated him that night, paid the innkeeper to look after him. And Jesus says, that is your neighbor. That is how you love your neighbor as yourself. That is it. That is it. How you love your neighbor yourself. John, who hated the Samaritans, do you think he learned the lesson? Do you think he became, why he became the disciple who Jesus loved? Well, you know, John was um, later taken to Asia Minor, he settled in Ephesus, as some people say. Polycarp told us that John lived in Ephesus till 95, and he, reign, he was during the reign of Domitian, where he was taken to Rome to stand trial for his faith. He was thrown into a pot of boiling oil, but he miraculously escaped. They threatened to kill him, to reject his blood, but John says, I am not going to this reject my Lord. And John was the one who wrote, greater lovers, no one than this, than to lay down one life for his friends. Are you listening to me, people? Are you listening to me, Christians? Greater lovers, no man than this, than to lay down my life for my friends. John was a different man. How could he be? the disciple who Jesus loved. How could he be the disciple who Jesus loved? Well, let me tell you that John was old and he couldn't even walk, legends say. And he was taken to church on a litter, like a stretcher. And after the preacher addressed the congregation, he would ask John if there was any new word from Jesus. Then John would raise himself up and say, yes, Jesus says we must love one another. And from Sabbath to Sabbath and Sabbath, John would say the same thing. Jesus says, love one another. And they said, John, is that all you can say, love one another? Does this man have nothing else to say except love one another? Is that all that Jesus can say, love one another? 
How about guarding the edges of the Sabbath? How about selling your goods to give to the poor? How about preaching the gospel to the end of the earth? How comes you are telling us every week, love one another? Well, when we look at the Bible, we see that the word, the disciple who Jesus loved was written in the imperfect tense. And when I looked at the International Standard Version, it, it said it wrote it the right way. It says one of the disciples, the one whom Jesus kept loving. Then when Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he kept loving. And when he ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus kept loving. Oh, love that could not let me go. You see people, John was saying, even when I was a racist, I was a terrorist, I was evil, I was proud, I was bold, I was ambitious, but Jesus kept on loving me. And that is what changed my heart. John says, yes, I was a son of thunder. I would call down fire from heaven and burn up my enemies, but Jesus kept on loving me. Jesus kept on loving me. I was not a very nice person. I was evil and I was bad-minded. I was a racist, but Jesus kept on loving me. I wish the people of God would understand that this is the lesson that God wants us to know that people need to understand that it is love that changed John. It is not just the disciple whom Jesus loved. It is the disciple who Jesus kept on loving him. Jesus kept on loving him. God accepts no distinctions between color and caste in his kingdom. God does not accept any folly that people talk about. The author of divine truth tells us that we should love one another as our own self. The work of the good Samaritan is the example we are to follow. In the, in, in the pen of inspiration, right? Racial separation is not permanent. Walls of separation have been built up between the whites and the blacks, but these walls will tumble down like the walls of Jericho when Christians obey the word of God, which tells us to have supreme love for our master and impartial love to our, um, to our neighbors. Let every church whose members claim to believe the truth for this time look at the people who are neglected and don't trust them. Because Jesus says we are to love our neighbors ourselves. Who is our neighbor? The one who is beaten, the one who is downtrodden, and the one who is in prison, the one who is in slavery. Yes, the one is in prison. You know, the, the, in, in 1 John 4, 20, it is written, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he, would, he or he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? How can you love God whom you have not seen and claim to love? How can you claim to love God you have not seen and don't love your brother who you see? You are a liar. That's what the Bible says, not me. I don't make it up. First John 4, 20. If you claim to love God, but don't love your brother, you are a liar. And you need to recognize that. So you need to now make amends. You need to change your ways. And so as we are coming to a close, we look at love. Yes, we look at love. First Corinthians 13, 1 to 7 tells us, the, the great love chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 
13 verse 1 to 7 tells us this. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I have become sound in brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. And this is an expression of the obedience of all who love God and keep his commandments. It is brought into action in the life of every and true believer. Let me give you what it means. Jesus says when he comes in the end, he is going to divide the nations into the sheep and the goats. Listen, he didn't say in the white and the black. He didn't say he's going to divide them by ethnic groups. He didn't say he's going to divide them by how much money they had or what position they had in this world. Jesus says he's going to divide the world into the sheep and the goats. And then I just put the part for you where he talks to the goats, those on the left hand, Matthew 21, 41 to 45. Matthew, not 21, Matthew 25. Then he said, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, I surely I say to you, Inasmuch as you did do it, did not do it to one of the least of these, the least of these, the least of these, you did not do it to me. Notice now, there are people in prison that you don't visit. And I'm not just talking about those people who are locked up in prison, falsely accused. I'm thankful that there are people who go and find DNA evidence to let them out. Many, many people. Blacks, whites of all ethnicities have been framed and locked up in prison. And we need to go and visit them. But even more so is those who are outside of the jails, but they are still in prison. The people in prison are those who believe that there is such a thing called racial superiority. They are in mental slavery. I want to tell you. And God is saying, you better believe it that if you don't minister to the least of these, you have rejected me. The people who are enslaved, who are deprived, who have been fooled, who have been deceived, they are in prison as well. When people come to believe that they are inferior, they are in prison, they need mental health services. When there are black people who have made it, who have been successful and look down on their black brothers who are struggling and are not successful. You are in prison. You have been deceived. I don't care who you are. You could be a judge. You could be a doctor. You could be a lawyer. You could be somebody high in government. If you look down on your black brothers or your Asian brothers, or your white brothers and sisters, if you look down on somebody and said, I made it and you can make it too and you don't give them any help and you stamp in their face, you are in prison and you need help too. So that's why I'm giving you help coming to preach the gospel. The Christian's response is to minister to those in prison, to those who are in hospital, to those who are hungry, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When people think that riches 
represent the sign of God's prosperity. The Bible says it is harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God than for a harder for a camel to go through the eyes of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. What shall you give for your soul? You rob, you loot, you exploit, you steal, and you think you can get away with it? God is going to demand an accounting. So you better understand you need to get out of prison. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Exodus 22, 21, God said, you shall neither mistreat a stranger nor oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I really would like to go on some more, but I don't want to drag out the time. But I want to tell you that love, love that God speaks about is the love that we are to practice. The love that we are to practice. We should not believe that we can avoid practicing that love. We cannot. Love is the greatest commandment on the, of the world. And we need to know that God commands us to love. Love, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, but though I give my body to be burned, but I have love, it profits me nothing. How is it since love is given? Since one can give all their goods and give all his body and have not love. The flesh profits nothing. The giving of goods is not the giving of one's life. People may give selfishly with a motive to secure applause or honor. Some politicians jump on the bandwagon and say they are interfering and interceding, but it's just because they want votes, just because they want goods, they want votes, they want popularity. That is nothing. I want to tell you, if your love is not of yourself, if your love is not of your heart, that is not love. If you have all the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries and all knowledge and of all faith, and you can remove mountains, but you have love, you are nothing. If you live for yourself alone, you are nothing because love means somebody else, giving yourself to somebody. Love suffers long. You must be willing to bear with all rejection and reproach. And no matter how terrible a person is, no matter how evil a person is, you still go and pour down love on them. Jesus, when he was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know what they, not what they do. He was giving love, same, all the way to his death. Love was on his mind. Love envies not. We don't need to be, to be envious of the success of other people. We don't need to be robbing other people. We don't need to be scheming other people. But we don't even need to be emulating other people's successful lifestyles. lifestyles. All we need to do is to be content with what we have. Live with what we have. Don't be, don't be covetous because that is what some people do. Yes, on both sides, the people who oppress others, they covet what the others get. There are some people who say it is a zero sum game. If, if the oppressed people get some money, then I get less, that is covetousness. And then some of the, the oppressed people say, if I rob that person, then I will get my reward. That is covetousness, love, don't rob anybody. Don't envy anybody of what they have or what they should have. That is love. Love does not parade itself. Don't display your words, your attainments, your powers to boast, to be arrogant. When you see a person boasting of all that they have acquired and they are arrogant, they do you know that they don't love. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Rejoice when another person is prosperous. Rejoice when another ma makes it. Don't be envious and pull them down and think you are better than themselves. Love is not puffed up, does not behave rudely. 
our only true possession is our character. Everything that we take into this, what we have in this world, we are going to leave it when we get out of it. Love is not provoked. No matter the provocation, you're helping somebody and they despise you, help them still. Don't be annoyed. Don't call, um, don't call down hell and, 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 and destruction on people if they, if they are unloving, if they are rude, if they are crude. Don't be provoked. Love must be like God who loves us even when we are evil. Love thinks no evil. Love thinks no evil. Don't take into account. Don't consider what the person has done. I saw one young lady online with millions of views talking about the so-called evil that George Floyd did in his life. She has no love. Instead of being sorrowful that somebody was brutally murdered, she is there highlighting the stuff. I have people in my own family who, who don't seem to get it straight that when we are called upon to love, we are to have sympathy, we are to think no evil. Somebody was brutally murdered. Don't go dredging up their past. They were murdered. Be sorrowful. It could be you. It could be your brother. It could be your sister. You could be your relative. It could be your friend. Think no evil. Don't be provoked. Don't rejoice in iniquity. Somebody dies and you say, ah, good, good for him. He should have been dead a long time. No, love does not rejoice in iniquity. Love only rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, resists all evil, no matter what co comes upon us. Bear all things. Moses failed when he didn't bear up under the, the provocation of the children of Israel. So I want to tell you today that God calls us to a higher standard, to love. And God says we must love our neighbor as ourselves. We must love our neighbor as ourselves. Love people the way we want to be loved. And that is the only way. That is the only way that we are going to overcome racism. So as I come to a close this day, I want to call upon everyone out there. I want to call upon you to understand that it is the thief, the devil, who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Don't join in the looting. Don't celebrate when somebody is hurt, is murdered. Don't feel happy when somebody gains somebody's property by being a criminal. Don't feel that the man deserves to die because he had some bad things in his past. Be sorrowful. Be angry even, but don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And then do something. Reach out to those who are oppressed. Reach out to the oppressors and let them see love in action. Because just like John, who was a racist, just like John, who was willing to kill people who he didn't like, Jesus kept on loving him. Who is the disciple that Jesus loved? It's not just John. It is George Floyd. It is you. It is me. It is that police officer. It is the president. It is Joe Biden. It is Barack Obama. It is the man who from nowhere who we don't know his name. It isn't even the man you call the bum. Even the drug dealer. Jesus keeps on loving us. And when we get that straight, then the walls of racism will come turning down. So as I close this message,
I invite you to join me in a word of prayer as we call upon the name of our Lord and ask him to give us that heart to love one another. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your truth. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we will know the better way, the perfect way, which is to love one another. Help us not to rejoice in iniquity. Help us, O oh Lord, not to be partakers of violence, but help us to be angry at injustice and protest and call for the right to be done. But even more so, help us to do good to others, to show love to all within our sphere of influence. And so the walls of Jericho will come tumbling down. Let us march our seven times around the walls of Jericho. Let us shout and blow our trumpets of love so that the people inside, the enemy inside, the fear in our hearts, the mental slavery, the oppression, the anguish, the grief, the sorrow, the revenge, the rape, the rage, the wrath, will all paralyze in fear and give way to your glory. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So thank you for joining me, and I hope we will see you next time.